Okay, hello guys. This is our class number five, uh, which is the chapter 13. Uh, that is called Monetary Policies and Exchange Rates. Uh, we have two main objectives in this chapter. The first, time, th the first one is to examine the transformation from government to bank control through the lens of a state-centered approach to monetary and exchange rate politics. However, you have to keep in mind that uh, even though uh, this approach is not often called a, a state-centered approach, it contains the central characteristic of such as an approach. Why? Because you will learn that uh, we have to insulate policymakers from short-term po uh, political pressures that can raise social welfare. Why? Why do we need to insulate policymakers uh, from the short-term political pressures? Well, because uh, there is a fact. Institutions that insulate a monetary policy from politics um, could be two, the independent central banks and fixed exchange rates. And if we impose or implement these types of institutions, we can eliminate these uh, inflation uh, patterns and then we can rise social work. Why? Well, because if you recall from the last class, uh, after the World War II, uh, governments uh, started to use Keynesian policies to boost uh, uh, their economies. Uh, remember, uh, between World War One and World War II, uh, economies uh, face higher levels of unemployment and recessions. So after Keynes, uh, governments use uh, uh, monetary and fiscal expansionary policies to boost their economies and to create employment and to uh, give to workers the possibility to be employed. However, the problem started in the 80s. Why? Because the majority of countries created hyperinflations and recessions. Why? Because when you inject a lot of money in your economy, well, people have more money in their pockets and they started to um, uh, demand more and more and more goods and services. The problem is that uh, the prices of the goods start to rise and that create, uh, creates uh, uh, inflation. However, in the 80s, the majority of the countries around the world uh, abused that type of policies and that create hyperinflation. What is a hyperinflation? When there are not prices at all. There are goods, there are services, but there are no prices because um, uh, the volatility of the prices is so high that you cannot uh, establish a price for a, for a good or for a service. Um, due to that, in the 90s, uh, countries started to give independence to the central bank to control inflation. And inflation was uh, uh, become uh, one of the most important objectives in the monetary policy. And we are going to uh, understand that in this chapter. So let's uh, start with the monetary policy and unemployment. Recall from the last class, the Philip curve. The Philip curve shows the trade off between unemployment and inflation. And we studied the case of the United States and China. And as you can see in this slide, there is a negative relationship between unemployment and inflation. So if countries use uh, monetary policies, expansionary monetary policies to boost their economies, well, they are going to reduce their unemployment. However, once they started to reduce the unemployment, the inflation started to grow because workers have more money and they are willing to spend that money in the economy. So they are going to demand more. And when the demand shifts to the right, well, the prices started to grow and grow, creating inflation. However, uh, in the contemporary economics, um, that uh, relationship between uh, inflation and unemployment, well, is not such stable. Why? Because the trade-off is possible in the short run. I mean, in the short run, uh, econ uh, economists refer 
to one or two years. So in the short run, you can use expansionary monetary policies to reduce the unemployment even when you are creating um, uh, inflation. However, the problem is that a government cannot use monetary policies to reduce unemployment for any, any extended period without generating an even higher rate of inflation. Why? Because there is something that is called natural rate of unemployment. And what is a natural rate of unemployment? Well, the natural rate of unemployment refers to the level of, of unemployment that exists in an economy when it is operating at its potential output or full employment level. In other words, in other words, when you are hiring all your labor and you're using all your capital, even when you are in that in that uh, moment, there are, um, uh, the economy faces a level of unemployment. Why? Because it, there are more labor than uh, uh, jobs in the economy. And this is a fact. So, so that's why uh, for economists or the contemporary economists, um, economists, uh, the natural rate of unemployment do, does not depend on inflation. So you can uh, create higher levels of uh, um, uh, monetary policies. Uh, I mean, you can create expansionary monetary policies, but that level, that level of unemployment cannot be reduced. And there are two main uh, characteristics of the natural rate of unemployment. The first one that you have to keep in mind is the structural and frictional unemployment. <laughs> What is a structural unemployment? The structural unemployment occurs when there is a mismatch between the skills and qualification of job seekers and the available job opportunities. This means that even when you are uh, creating uh, or injecting money in your economy, well, there is always a, a mismatch. So the, the qualifications and the uh, skills that you are seeking in the, in, in the economy, they are not available. So the job opportunity is not possible to be uh, occupied for a worker. A frictional employment is more the short run unemployment because it refers to the temporary unemployment that occurs when individuals are transitioning between jobs or entering uh, in the labor market. So the natural rate of unemployment is more related to this idea of a structural unemployment. Um, is that level when you when there are no job opportunities? So if there are job opportunities, there are not uh, workers that could uh, fulfill the qualifications and the requirements of that uh, job. And you have to keep in mind, and this is the second characteristic of the natural rate of unemployment, that the, the natural rate of unemployment varies over time and across economies. Uh, it's not fixed and it can change over time due to various factors which are not uh, 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 inflation because it's more related to the techno technological advances, the changes in the labor market institutions, demographics, and of course, government and policies that are not related to fiscal and um, monetary uh, policies. It's more related to if the country or the government start to implement uh, education, more education, more... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, um, programs that create and enhance the human capital and so on and so forth. So, and the natural rate of unemployment is not the same in uh, uh, within countries. Uh, varies across different economies due to the structural and institutional differences. So, if we depict the level of unemployment in the Philip curve, well, the natural rate of unemployment is, uh, 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 or should uh, uh, um, uh, uh, be depicted as uh, in the slide. It is not depending on inflation. It's one level, one level. And a government cannot use monetary policy to move that level of unemployment below or above the natural rate of unemployment for more than 
short time Be because every economy will always experience some uh, levels of unemployment and that levels of unemployment are structural. So what is the problem? So the problem is that according to the story that we uh, uh, studied in the last uh, class before World War II, uh, economies uh, or the war faced uh, high levels of unemployment. There was a change in the uh, international system. We transitioned from the gold standard uh, system to the uh, Keynesian system, and uh, uh, citizens started to uh, demand the use of the monetary policies to boost the economies, and uh, that creates more employment, but as well, that creates more inflation. What is, but what is the problem with this type of policies? And why does inflation is not a consequence that economists want to tolerate? Because, because if we believe that the post keynesian uh, policies are a very good uh, policies to create more employment, well, the cost is the inflation. And why does inflation is not a consequence, is not a consequence that economists want to tolerate? Well, the problem is because the main uh, reason that these types of policies started to be implemented. Remember, workers and citizens demanded more intervention from the government, demanded that the monetary policies uh, to be autonomous. However, the problem is that risk. Why? Well, because at the end, wages, as economists define wages, is equal to the prices uh, times the marginal labor productivity. If we uh, transform that equation to the uh, percentage in increments, well, the increment of a, a wage um, should be equal to the uh, changes in the prices uh, sum or plus the changes of the productivity of the labor. However, the changes of the prices is the inflation. So at the end, the basic idea is that if you are working and you are receiving a salary, well, you expect that the salary in the next year uh, should be uh, incremented by at least the inflation. Why? Because you can um, or you desire to get the same pushing, uh, pur purchasing power. So you can at least keep the same, um, uh, the, the possibility to buy the same levels of goods and services that you are uh, demanding today and uh, tomorrow. Uh, so that's why workers recognize that inflation will erode the value of their nominal wage, which means that uh, when they are negotiating for a new uh, 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 wage, well, they they want to keep uh, uh, or to um, uh, get the same levels of uh, goods and services that they are demanding today. So they will take uh, inflation into account when they are negotiating their wage uh, contracts. If they have expectation of higher inflation, well, they will negotiate higher wages. If you are, I don't know, uh, assuming that you are working right now and you are receiving $100 and you uh, know for sure that the next year, you the inflation in the economy will be 10%. So, so in your next negotiation for the wage for the next year, you at least will demanding a 10% more of your wage from today. Why? Because you want to keep the same level of um, uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, purchasing power uh, or the same level of uh, utility that you are receiving uh, today and uh, from tomorrow. So that's why um, uh, uh, people, it's more uh, uh, focused on the idea of 
how they are they are expecting the prices are changing so so that expectation of higher inflations that's why i decided to change the inflation to the superscript e in order to to highlight the expectations so if people expect more inflation they will negotiate higher wages and that expectations will create unemployment why because if um uh, if uh, firms uh, have to pay more wages well the cost of the labor increases and they will demand lower uh, labor because at the end uh, firms demand labor as a any single product and uh, given the demand low, if the price is higher, the demand is lower. So that's why the problem here is that the expansionary monetary policies creates higher expected inflation. Because if you know that the government is injecting money to the economy, well, that will create inflation. And if the inflation, the uh, expectation of the inflation rises, well, you will demand higher uh, wages and higher wages will create unemployment. So the problem here is that expansionary monetary policies create higher levels of inflation or expected inflation, that expected inflation will uh, rise the level of uh, wages and the level of wages will create uh, uh, unemployment in the long run. So the monetary policies could reduce the unemployment in the short run, but increases the unemployment in the long run. In fact, that is called the, acceler the accelerationist principle. The accelerationist principle um, uh, is when a government uh, use monetary policy to keep unemployment below the natural rate of for any length, lengthy period. Uh, but the problem is that that will create inflation. So let's recall the, and let's use the Philip Corp to understand this point. Imagine that we uh, starting our example in the point A. So we are uh, here in this Philip Corp, uh, which is T1. So we are here in A and we are in the uh, natural rate of unemployment. The government, uh, the citizens uh, demand more intervention. So the government is used uh, expansionary monetary policies to reduce the, the, the unemployment from the uh, natural level. So we uh, uh, move uh, from the natural rate to the uh, uh, a level below of the natural rate, which is called UB. So in that process, we rise the inflation. I am, as you are saying in the video. So we move from A to B. So we are in the same uh, uh, Philip curve, but we reduce the unemployment even when we are creating uh, inflation. What is the problem? The problem is that we are not only re increasing the inflation today, but also we are increasing the expectation, the expectatives of more inflation. And because of that, unions negotiate higher levels of um, wages. Given that the wages are incre increasing, well, their own employment increases as well. So we move in the next year from B to C. And C, as you can see, um, is uh, a moment in, 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 in the economy when we return to the natural level of uh, unemployment, but with a higher level of inflation. If this is the case, and citizens demand again uh, intervention from the government to create uh, more employment, well, the government could use 
expansionary monetary policies, again, to reduce the level of unemployment. What is the problem again? That we are affecting the expectations again. So citizens and workers start to believe that the inflation will be higher in the next period. So they renegotiate their, um, their wages and again, they demand higher levels uh, or higher wages. And because of that, then employment returns to the uh, natural rate of unemployment. And we are in the new, in a new uh, Philip curve, which is T3, and we are in the point E. So that's why every time the economy uses the monetary policy to reduce unemployment, that rises the inflation. And in the next period, wages are adjusted and the unemployment rises, returning to its natural level uh, of unemployment. And this is a loop, but it, this is a bad loop because as you can see, the problem is that we all the time are returning to the natural rate of unemployment, but in a worse uh, scenario. Why? Because we have more and more and more inflation and the unemployment is not changing. In fact, remember this graph, the Philip curve that I depicted using uh, uh, a data from the World Bank uh, to prove that there is a, a Philip curve in the United States. Well, we can see <coughs> that the, the United States has uh, faced different uh, Philip curves uh, over time. So I decided to use uh, the unemployment and inflation uh, rates from 1960 to 2020. And as, as you can see, uh, at least the uh, United States has uh, uh, faced four uh, Philip curves. We started in the 60s, which is the uh, Philip curve, uh, the red Philip curve. So in the 60s, the uh, uh, United States um, had level uh, uh, um, uh, lower levels of unemployment because the unemployment uh, went from uh, 4% to 6% and um, moderate levels of inflation from 2% uh, to 4 uh, from 2% to 4% of inflation however uh, as every single country in the world well uh, the 70s uh, were another story. The 70s were a uh, decade where uh, the majority of the countries abused the uh, interventions policies and the expansionary policies. And because of that, if, as you can see, the Philip curve uh, moves from the red line to the green line. The, the green line is different in two ways. Uh, is the same relationship uh, the the is showing the negative relation between unemployment and inflation however it is different because the level of uh, of unemployment uh, increases and it is around uh, 5% to 10% and the level of inflation double from the maximum uh, that the U.S. face in the 60s was almost five. And now the maximum of the uh, inflation that the economy, the U.S. economy face was more than 10%. So as you can see, the Philip curve shifts to the right. And that was a crisis. High levels of inflation and increments of unemployment. The 80s, uh, from the 80s to nowadays, well, the economies uh, tries uh, around the world and in the United States, of course, try to implement different types or another types of monetary policies. 
And, and the way that the countries did that was to uh, give independence to their central banks. The United States doesn't have a central bank. They have a Federal Reserve, it's, it's kind of the same. Uh, a central bank is a bank where um, it's an institution that controls the currency and the monetary policies. So the Federal Reserve gain more in independence. And because of that, they uh, the, the Federal Reserve could control the inflation. And as you can see, the next uh, two uh, uh, Philip curves are the uh, orange line and the uh, blue line. And these uh, two uh, Philip curves are lower. So, so that independence of the central bank, it was a very good uh, movement because of a very good move because they could control inflation. They reduced inflation. However, the unemployment levels are higher uh, uh, in comparison to the 60s. So the uh, Axel, uh, Axel, uh, Axel, uh, Axel uh, I'm so sorry, I'm, uh, remember, I'm from Colombia. Uh, so English is not my mother tongue. So the, um, uh, the this principle um, uh, shows that inflation is a problem. Because any gains in, in employment uh, as an outcome from monetary expansion, well, is useful in the short term at best. However, that creates inflation, but not creates a rate of inflation. It creates a persistent increment of inflation over time. And the problem with the, with having uh, inflation is that that uh, creates at least five costs. The first one is that reduced purchasing, uh, purchasing power. Inflation erodes the, purchasing, the, the purchase, pur purchasing power of money. And you, when you are in an economy, when the inflation is higher and higher and higher, well, your money uh, cannot buy the same uh, goods and services that you are demanding today. So, so with inflation, your your income cannot give you the same levels of goods and services, and you are in a worse uh, scenario. The second cost is uncertainty. Why? Because when you are in an economy with high levels of inflation, well the prices are very volatile volatile so so you cannot uh, create uh, contracts and uh, the, that uh, volatility could create uh, unpredictable uh, movements and uncertainty for businesses and consumers and businesses and consumers cannot make uh, 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 good decisions uh, and, and they decided to postpone their consuming uh, the, their consuming and that reduces the uh, um, economic growth uh, uh, and that reduces the economic growth. The third uh, cost of having inflation is that uh, inflation um, um, changes the price the signals. Why? Because inflation can distort uh, the prices and remember uh, according to uh, economists the only information that a consumer needs to take uh, to make decisions is the price why because you have an income and you uh, extract from the price uh, unobservable uh, characteristics of the of the product of the good so so you can infer if the good is 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 good or or the quality and so on and so forth with the price. So so if the prices are changing uh, so fast, you cannot uh, extract uh, or you cannot have um, better information, and that's why you cannot uh, take better decisions. The fourth uh, cost is the um, is that um, inflation increased the production cost. Why? Because um, and with inflation, 
uh, wages uh, are higher, so so you have the firms have to to reduce their production. But not only uh, the wages are higher in an uh, economy with higher levels of inflation, also the intermediate goods. So so if you need to to rent or to buy a new machine, the price of that machine increases. And because of that, you are not able to produce more and you decide to reduce your level of production. And the fifth and final uh, cause of having inflation is that inflation reduces savings and investment. Why? Because inflation discourages savings and uh, the value of money decreases over time. And if there are lower uh, levels of savings in an economy, well, investment should be uh, uh, lower. Why? Because at the end, remember, as we uh, studied in the last uh, uh, in the last class, well, in equilibrium, savings should be equal to the investment, because investment is a loan. So, so if there are lower levels of savings, necessarily the economy should have level lower levels of investment. So because of that, how to solve this problem? How to solve the uh, uh, accelerationist principle? So, so in order to solve this problem, we have to understand that the monetary policy carries the uh, time consistency problem. And uh, there is a fact. Although most governments were determined to achieve and maintain low inflation, only few could do it. Why? Well, two main reasons. First, there are uh, higher uh, expectations of high inflation were deeply embedded in society. You always are thinking that the next year prices should be higher. And this is not a rule. This is an expectation, this is an idea that has permeated the day-by-day uh, -day life of any single person around the world. And because of that, inflation is higher next year and next year and next year. But the second one, that which is the most important one, is that politicians always have incentives to use expansionary policies to gain uh, political support. This is something that we studied the last class. So, so this is a time. Uh, th th this is our scenario. And to solve this problem, a government will have to make a credible commitment to deliver low inflation. What is a credible commitment? A promise, but not, not any promise. It's a promise that is considered reliable, trustworthy, and believable. But let me ask you a question. If the government says that they will reduce inflation, is that a, a promise um, that is a credible commitment? If you you can pause the video, try to analyze that question and take a few minutes, write down possible answers and let's uh, discuss uh, your answers uh, in a few minutes. Okay. What is the problem? The problem is that a government could not easily make credible commitments. This is a fact. And, uh, and the, if the government says that they are going to control and to have low inflation, well, that promise is not reliable, it's not trustworthy, and it is not uh, believable because governments confront time consistent consistency problem. A time consistency problem arises when the best course of action at a particular moment in time differs from the best course of action in general. And this is the best example to explain that. Imagine that today, which is uh, this tea. Today, the government may uh, make um, the, the following promise. We are going to reduce inflation. So you believe in that. You believe that the government will reduce 
the inflation. So if you believe that promise in the next day, which is T plus one, workers will demand lower wages. Why? Because they are expecting uh, lower inflation. And remember, wages are equal to prices times your productivity. So the increment of the wages is equal to the changes of prices plus the changes of your productivity. So inflation is a key element to understand how wages are changing over time. So if you believe the promise of your government, so the next day you will uh, demand lower wages because your expected inflations are lower. But the next, next day, in T plus two, politicians have incentives to use expansionary policies. Why? Because in T plus one, you believe it, so the wages are lower, so the unemployment is lower. So they reduce the, the unemployment and they want to be reelected. So they use expansionary policies to create uh, higher uh, political support and to be reelected in the next uh, uh, election. And because of that, the next day in T plus three, you learn that the government is not credible and the cycle breaks and you are not willing to believe to any single promise that the government could uh, say. So this is the time consistency problem. Today, today, reduce inflation is a good promise, but tomorrow the incentives, the political incentives are against this promise. And because of that, politicians have incentive to betray you, to betray that promise and to do uh, 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 a different action from that promise. So the main consequence to the time uh, consistency problem is that the this interaction between wages, <coughs> wage bargainers and the government has perverse consequences for social welfare. <coughs> that could create either inflation or employment, and uh, the inflation or employment will be higher uh, than it would be if the government could make a credible commitment to low inflation. So, so we need to, to control the government. We need to separate from the government the possibility to use monetary policies to boost the economy. So this is the commitment mechanisms. Government try to establish a credible commitment to low inflation by creating commitment mechanisms in the form of institution that tie their hands. So they, the only way that the promise could be credible, that the promises could be a credible commitment is when we tie their hands. How could we tie the politician hands? Well, there are two uh, uh, possible answers. The first one is, is the a fixed exchange rate. Recall the unholy trinity. If the government uh, uh, by law um, is abide by the fact that they have to uh, follow a fixed exchange rate, well, the monetary policy is not autonomous. So they cannot use the mon uh, expansionary monetary policies in order to create more employment. However, is it possible? And the answer is no. Uh, why? Because we are not in the gold standard system. We are past gold standard system. And in the uh, Keynesian policies, um, government, uh, gain the possibility to use fiscal and monetary expansionary policies to intervene the economy. So this is not a possibility. So the second uh, possibility is independent central banks. 
And central bank independence is the degree to which the central bank can set monetary policy free from interference by the government. So, of course, central bank is public, it's a public institution, but that doesn't mean that it's controlled by politicians. So, <clears throat> the central bank independence is a function of three main things. The first one is the degree to which the central bank is free to decide what economic objectives to pursue. It is not decided by the politicians, it is decided by the central bank itself. The second uh, 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 pillar that could uh, explain the independence is the degree to which the central bank is free to decide how to set monetary policy in pursuing uh, of this objective. And the third is the degree to which central bank decisions can be reversed by other branches of the government. So when you have a total independent central bank is because the central bank is able to decide the economic objectives. No one is able to reverse uh, the decision of the central bank and the central bank is um, able to decide the monetary policy to pursue and achieve that economic objectives. In the other um, part of the spectrum, we have uh, central banks that are fully subordinated by the government. So the monetary <clears throat> or the economic objectives are not um, economic, are more political, and the monetary policy is decided by the government, is decided by the politicians, and every single decision could be reversed by the government. So that's why if we grant to the central bank independence, we could solve the time consistency problem. Why? Because we are taking uh, out uh, of the politician hands the monetary policy completely. So monetary policy is no longer set by politicians and uh, <clears throat> we are uh, isolating the monetary policy uh, from the short run polit political considerations. So because of that, we can, ans uh, uh, we can make uh, this question. Do independent central bank actually have the economic consequences that are attributed to them in theory? I mean, if we uh, uh, give to the central bank's uh, independency, we can control inflation, we can uh, create a uh, reduce unemployment, and what happens with the economic growth? So let's begin with the inflation. I'm from Colombia, as you know, uh, from uh, intro class and um, this is the level of inflation in Colombia uh, from 1970 to uh, 2020 and um, after the, the 80s uh, in fact in 1991 uh, we decide to give to the central bank fully independence uh, why? Because in the 70s and in the 80s, we face higher levels of inflation. We never uh, faced or experienced hyperinflations, uh, but we experienced higher levels of inflation, as you can see. Uh, levels of inflation around more than 20%, and even in... And, uh, um, in 1978, we uh, experienced a level of inflation of more than 30%, which is a lot. So because of that, we decided in 1991, we uh, reform our constitution, and by constitution, we, give, uh, we gave to the central bank the independency. So as you can see, uh, which is the red line, the central bank uh, independency uh, index, um, the central bank uh, started to be with a higher level of independency. And after that uh, 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 political decision, the levels of inflation started to uh, reduce. And 
um, this is a very good example that when you are giving the independence to a central bank, the monetary policy is out of the hands of politicians and the political pressures to use monetary policies to uh, boost their economy, but to, uh, uh, in reality, to uh, uh, give uh, more political support to politicians. And uh, that's why I decided to show you this uh, beautiful graph. However, we can say, and I decided to use uh, all the countries around the world and try to see if the more independence uh, creates uh, lower levels of inflation around the world. Uh, because in the chapter, um, Oddly, uh, only depict uh, um, uh, industrialized countries, 15 indus industrialized countries from 1960 to 1990. And I am depicting here the uh, 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s and 2010s decades with all countries. And as you can see, in every single decade, countries, that have uh, more uh, independence uh, levels in their central banks, they have or they face lower levels of inflation. That's why the red line has a negative slope. What about economic growth? If we give uh, more independence to your central bank, what happens with the economic growth? Well, it's expected that um, your economic growth should be lower. Why? Because the monetary policy is not thought to boost their economy. It's thought to control the inflation. And with lower levels of inflation, well, there are lower, um, uh, the monetary policy is not expansionary and could be contractionary. So let's see. Again, that happens in the these four decades that countries that have given to their central banks more independence, well, they face higher levels and uh, lower levels of economic growth. And what happens with unemployment? Well, if the central bank is more independent, well, the economy faces high levels of unemployment. That's why the relationship is positive. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the more independence, the higher levels of uh, uh, unemployment. Okay, guys, this is the end of our class. Uh, Again, if you have any question, be please be free to send me an email, and I will be very gladly, glad, gladly to, uh, or very glad to um, answer your question. So let's stop here and uh, see you in the next class. Bye.